Let's open our Bibles to Matthew 26. As you're turning there, this is Communion Sunday, the, the highlight of our month. The highlight of our month together as believers is when we gather as a family around the table that God has invited us to, and he sits on one side of the table, we're on the other, and we're communing with him. But communion, Matthew 26 tells us, starting in verse 26, is something else. There's a prophetic element in communion. And Jesus is the one that said that every time we celebrate communion, we're saying, do everything you promised. Bring into your kingdom. Jesus, come back. All that stuff in Revelation is what we're longing for you to do so you can come back and restore your kingdom and set up your rule on this earth. A lot of people don't realize communion is completely tied to the book of Revelation. Not just the worshiping the lamb that was slain, but the fact that in verse 29 of chapter 26, Jesus said, I'm not partaking in communion anymore until someday when I've established my Father's kingdom, I'm going to celebrate it new with you. That is a marvelous thought for us to put prophecy in perspective. We are supposed to be constantly longing for Christ's kingdom to come, for his rule to be over this earth, for him to right all wrongs. So this morning, thy kingdom come is a big connection between the Lord's Supper, God's kingdom, our lives each day, and everything we're learning about the Antichrist in Revelation. We're praying and we're longing, and at communion today we're saying, God, finish your plan. Do what you said. Well, that big connection between the Lord's Supper and God's kingdom is really beautifully laid out here in Matthew 26. And when you think about Christ's death as he became sin for us, his burial as he took our sins forever away, and his resurrection as he left our sins forever paid for, and he rose to give us endless life, that's what we celebrate. But there is also that wonderful connection And that's the first connection between communion and Christ's return. So, Matthew 26, and we're going to read verses 26 to 30. Let's stand together as we read God's Word. Let's, as we stand, listen, follow along in your Bibles, and let's ask the Lord to help us make that big connection between communion and His coming and all that He has told us that He's going to do in that coming. Let's read together. You follow along. Matthew 26, verse 26. And as they were eating... Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now verse 29. Usually we stop, but verse 29. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on, Until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Verse 30, and when they had sung in him, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's bow together. Dear Father, I pray that you'd teach us the wonder of connecting, as you do, every day of our life with Christ's coming. Now we know that you have already promised to us in the church that you're going to come or call to take us safely home but this coming that is described here is the establishment of your kingdom on earth and Lord we know we will come with you but we long for that day to come when you come when you overthrow Satan when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ and we see you reigning over this world that you made, and over us, your creatures. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would teach us the wonders of connecting what you have promised and this table we gather at today. In the precious name of Jesus, we ask that. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, we're going to do a a quick walk through. First, the implications. Look look at this connection, uh, which is actually not only Christ's coming, but at the end of verse 29, new in my Father's kingdom. It isn't just Jesus' is coming. It's Jesus' is coming to rule. That's the second connection. Christ rule on earth. Now, a lot of people, it's kind of fuzzy. Kind of the coming of Christ, it's just kind of fuzzy. 
it's not fuzzy in the Bible. Okay, Jesus said, I'm literally going to come. I'm going to sit on the throne of my father, David. I am going to rule with an iron rod over the nations of the earth. I am going to bring every promise I made to, to my chosen people of promise, the Jewish people. The 12 tribes are going to be the center point of the earth, and all the other nations on earth are going to come and look at what I'm doing there, and they're going to learn about me. Now, none of that has happened. In history, Jesus has never sat on any throne on earth. He's never ruled over Israel. They rejected him and crucified him and spat on him and mocked him and everything else. This is all future. And look what Jesus says in verse 29. He says, I am going to drink this cup new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, the first question we have to ask, if you're doing an inductive Bible study, you have to make observations and try and figure out exactly what we're reading meant, not to me today, but to them then, when they got it. Those that were sitting around the table, hearing Jesus say that, what on earth was in their mind? What was he communicating to them? Well, just for, for one note, back up to chapter 19, because he's already told them this is coming. Chapter 19 of Matthew, just back up uh, a few chapters. Jesus promised that his disciples were going to join him in this special celebration. And, and, and to the disciples, my father's kingdom spoke of security and victory. It was Jesus saying, what I promised you is going to happen. Now, what had he promised to them? What, what secure victory was Jesus referring to? Well, look at chapter 19, verse 28. Because one of the big promises Jesus made was he was going to come back and rule over the messianic. See, they were all saying, you're the Christ. Now, Christ to us is just a sound, a word, Christ. Actually, that word is Mashiach, Messiah. Christos means the anointed Messiah, the promised one. Jesus said, I'm the promised one. And they all knew what the promise was, that he was going to reign as Messiah over this kingdom that was going to overspread the whole earth. And so look at verse 28. And Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, in the regeneration... What's the regeneration? Well, that's a complicated word. It's only two times in the New Testament. It talks about the regeneration that we have by the Spirit of God, the washing of regeneration, you know, that concept of salvation. The other meaning for it is right here. It's not when we get saved. It's when God regenerates the kingdoms of this world. That he st Actually, regeneration uh, is made up of two words. Genesis, we get Genesis from it, beginning, and pollen, which means again. So it's again a Genesis. It's again a beginning, again a new start. When God restarts humanity, what is that? That's when he comes to rule. He tells us about it. I don't have time to read every verse, but he said, I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats. I'm going to send the goats out, and the sheep are going to come into my kingdom, and they're going to populate this kingdom. But it's not in heaven. It's on earth. One fifth of the Bible describes it as right here on earth and that Jesus is going to actually be ruling out of Jerusalem over the whole earth and there's going to be no rebels. Satan's going to be and his demons are going to be in captivity and there's going to be no poisonous animals, no, no carnivorous animals, no poisonous insects. I mean, the United Nations believes that they have it and if you go to New York City today and look at the UN building, it says the lion will lay down by the lamb. Wow, they believe that much of the Bible, at least. And it says, and they'll beat their swords into plowshares. That's right out of Isaiah, talking about the millennium, the messianic earthly rule of Christ. So look what he says. In that regeneration, when I do everything I promised as a Messiah, the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, and you who have followed me will also sit, now it's getting a big promise, on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, there was a whole movement, uh, uh, what was his name, Herbert W. Armstrong, Bris British Israelitism. He talks about the 12 tribes and they're lost. The tribes are certainly not lost to God. He knows right where they are. And they are going to be on earth and they're going to be ruled over by the 12 apostles, who are also the 12 foundation stones of heaven. And the 12 tribes are the 12 gates into heaven. So the, the, the future plans God has included these disciples. And so Jesus gave them this big promise. So in Matthew 26, Jesus ended communion with the words, my father's kingdom. In Matthew 19, 28, he talks about his father's kingdom. It's going to be them literally sitting in seats of authority, helping him do something on earth. 
that one-fifth of the Bible, one out of every five verses, talks about this. I mean, if you take the kingdom stuff out of the Bible, it'll fall apart because it's so much. It's everywhere. It just fills from cover to cover. So, what exactly would Jesus Christ's disciples have understood that kingdom of the Father to be? Well, the answer to that is Jesus had already explained that kingdom. Now, let me do a little visual. Matthew 26 is here. Matthew 19 is here. What's just before Matthew 26? Just before the Lord's Supper is Matthew 25 and Matthew 24. In fact, let's turn there. I want to show you what just before the Lord's Supper, what Jesus had told them was going to be the, the inauguration of his coming to rule his Father's kingdom. Jesus Christ is coming back. He is coming back, the second coming, not his coming for the church that Revelation talks about where he takes us out of this world so he can begin doing all this stuff with Israel. He's not referring to that coming. He's referring to his coming where every eye will see him in the clouds and everybody will mourn and wail and hide and try and burrow into the ground and where all the earth will be just terrified of his coming. That's the second coming. Jesus said, I'm coming back for you and I'm going to bring blessings and I'm going to come and take you to my father's house and I'm going to, you're going to dwell with me. Those two are very distinctly different in the Bible. This one, look at chapter 24, is the, the explanation of the coming kingdom. Written down for us in Matthew 24 and 25 was what Jesus Christ said and taught, and we can trace exactly what the disciples would have thought his father's kingdom was because he tells them. He tells them what's going to be his coming back and what he's going to do. And so basically we could say, Matthew 24 and 25 are Jesus preceding the Lord's Supper with a summary of the future. Jesus precedes that supper telling all this prophetic stuff that we're going to look at. And then at the supper, he says, now, I already taught you what's going to happen, but until that happens, I'm not going to drink this cup new with you until my Father's kingdom comes to earth. Now, what did he tell him was going to happen? Number one, uh, this is what Jesus said. He gives three essential points. Look at verse 15 of chapter 24. First, the trouble leading up to Christ's coming kingdom rule will start with one man's actions in Jerusalem's holy place. Look what verse 15 says. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads let him understand. Now, that's a complicated verse. Jesus is citing an Old Testament passage from Daniel. And Jesus said a person, he calls them the abomination that causes desolation, and he says they're going to stand in a place. Well, what's the, let's just take, unpack this. What is the, when it says they're standing in the holy place? Well, that word is used, I mean, that expression, holy place, is used 54 times in the Old Testament. 100% of the time, it's the temple or before the temple, the tabernacle. So all 54 in the Old Testament, it's the tabernacle or the temple. In the New Testament, it's used five times, primarily in Hebrews, every time referring to the, the holy place of the temple, like Herod's temple, Solomon's temple, using of the place where the Ark of the Covenant, where the menorah, where the bread, uh, the showbread, in the altar of incense, and the brazen, all those things, that was called the holy place. Now, now look what he says. When you see this person, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of by Daniel, standing in the holy place, the temple, that's in Jerusalem. Now that's led to a lot of people saying, wow, this, this has already happened. That, that, you know, that's Antiochus or that's the Romans when they came and because there's no temple there today. Yeah, but God said there's a temple there in the tribulation. It's in Revelation 11. John says there's a temple. He, he sees it. He talks about it. Paul says there's a temple. Paul says the very same thing. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians that the Antichrist is going to be in the temple. What temple? The temple that's in Jerusalem. So basically, Jesus says the trouble that's going to cause his coming kingdom rule is when a certain person, this abomination that, that Daniel talked about. Now, real quickly, just keep your place there and turn back to Daniel chapter 9. Remember, we were in eight last, or seven. 
last time. Skip forward to chapter 9. I just want to do two verses in there. Chapter 9, verse 26 and 27. And we'll do a simple explanatory Bible study. We'll read through it and talk about what it means. It says, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. What 62 weeks? Well, it's the time between the, the rebuilding of Jerusalem and Jesus being crucified. It, it actually starts back in verse 25, and it says that, that people are going to come back and they're going to rebuild Jerusalem. They're going to put up the wall. They're going to put the streets down. And after seven weeks and 62 weeks, seven is in chapter uh, 9, verse 25, after those 69 weeks, Jesus is going to be crucified. How long is 69 weeks? Well, it's about 483 days if the weeks are days. Between Nehemiah's time and Christ's crucifixion is not 483 days. So we know these aren't literal seven-day weeks. Now, in chapter 10, in verse 2, whenever it has the number, like three full weeks, those are literal seven-day weeks. But this word is actually heptad. It's actually sevens. So there's going to be 69 sevens. Well, if you multiply 69 times seven years, you get 483 years, and it happens to be exactly how long it was from Nehemiah until the crucifixion. But what's interesting is it ends with one week outstanding. Now watch in verse 26. After the 62 and seven weeks, Messiah will be cut off. That's the crucifixion, but not for himself. That's the substitutionary atonement. But look now, here comes something beautiful. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70? Daniel said, somebody's coming. The Roman Empire. We all know that. Titus and the Ninth Legion came and they camped on Mount Scopus and they leveled the place. So look what it says in verse 26. The people who destroyed the city and the sanctuary are going to have a prince who is to come. That's where, if you've ever heard in your mind of the revived Roman Empire, it doesn't come from Hal Lindsey or John Walvert or John Darby. It comes from Jesus Christ and Daniel. And God says that the Roman Empire is going to resurface in the future. The same people that destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70 are coming back. Well, actually, they never left. They've just kind of been fragmented. And every piece of the old Roman Empire has had its day in the sun. Every part of the Roman Empire has ruled a vast amount of this earth, the last one being Britain, who ruled a bigger empire than anybody's ever ruled. But those people, the revived Roman Empire, is going to have a leader. He's called the prince in verse 26. Now look at him being talked about in verse 27. Then he, who is that? The prince who is to come, the revived Roman emperor, who the Bible calls the Antichrist. He, and look at this, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. There's the other week. And how many is it seven days? No. It's, it's in context. It's seven years. One week of years. Seven years. That's how we get the seven-year tribulation. Right from here. One week. It's seven years. But he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, there's, there's where you get, you've heard of mid-trib this or that, or you've heard of the three and a half years and three and a half years if you've seen charts. That's what it's from. In the middle of the week, he, who is the he? It's the he of verse 27, he shall confirm. Who's that? It's the prince of verse 26, who is to come, the Roman revived empire leader. He will bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. So that means some in this week of years, this seven-year period, the Jews are allowed to go back to sacrifice and offering. Boy, will that take an amazing thing for the Muslims to let them do that in Jerusalem. But, but this leader is going to bring an end to their sacrifices. And here's Christ's quote. And on the wings of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. So that is exactly what Jesus is talking about. Go back to Matthew 24 and look at verse 15. Therefore, when you see this man in Jerusalem, in the temple, that is causing this problem and stopping the, the sacrifice in the temple and breaking his covenant with Israel, then that's when everything is going to start happening. So the first thing Jesus says is the trouble leading up to Christ's coming in verse 15 of chapter 24 happens when the Antichrist is in the temple and he puts up his image and we read that in Revelation. Now look in verse 16. Where does all this happen? Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. All this happens in Jerusalem that's in the region of Judea. So all this happens in a literal place with a literal person. Second, 
Look at what Jesus says in verse 21. His coming kingdom rule will follow a global holocaust. Look what verse 21 says. It says, for then there will be a great tribulation. Now we're finding where that term comes from. Where the seven years comes from, it's from what Jesus said is in Daniel. Where does the term, the tribulation, come from? It's right here. Jesus is the one that introduces us to the great tribulation. You know, and a lot of people say, well, this is all describing um, A.D. 70. Okay, let's let Jesus tell us if this is describing A.D. 70. Jesus says... For then there will be a great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor shall ever be. And unless, verse 22, those days were shortened, no flesh would survive. Have a million people ever been killed in a battle like were killed in the siege and destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70? Mm Mm-hmm, over and over again. Uh, What, 20 million to 50 million in World War II? How many million in World War I? How many million since? I mean, 100,000 already in Syria. I mean, the world did not end in A.D. 70. It wasn't the worst time. It wasn't close to extinction of humanity. Jesus said this event is a singular event. Notice that Jesus uses extreme apocalyptic superlatives. Look back at 21 and 22. He says it's great. He said it's not, nor ever shall be anything like it. And he says no flesh will survive if I don't cut it short. Those are superlatives. Those are apocalyptic terms. What Jesus is talking about here hasn't happened yet. So no man has stood in Jerusalem in the temple yet and made the abomination that Jesus was talking about, and no apocalyptic event like the tribulation has happened yet. Third thing Jesus says, look at chapter 25. Turn over to chapter 25 and verse 31. He's still talking about this. In Matthew 25, 31, the third point Jesus makes is his coming rule is going to be seen by every one of us this morning. If you're a believer, you're going to see this event. Number two, by every saint that's ever lived. Number three, by every angel. Look what it says in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him. Have you ever thought about how many angels there are? God clears heaven of every angel. That means all the cherubim, all the seraphim, all the normal angels, the archangels, all of them, the seven that always face the throne, all of them, probably billions, are all coming with Christ at the front. Now we see this in in Revelation 19. It talks about at the front is Christ uh, on a white horse and, and it says King of Kings and Lord of Lords and he's coming and it says arrayed behind him. You know, every time... Every time I see the geese coming or going, you know how they always have that one in the front that's breaking the the way for them so they can all fly in the the, uh, airstream behind him? I always think about that, reminds me of that, of Christ breaking the way through and that huge cloud of angels. But Jude adds, Jude, the Lord's brother that wrote the book of Jude, in verse 14 he says, Behold, the Lord comes with myriadum of myriadum of saints. Myriads, we get in English, of myriads. The word myriad was the largest number in the Greco-Roman world. They didn't have a number higher than that. Myriad means an uncountable number. And Jude records that Enoch said, the Lord comes with myriads times myriads of saints. That made me think, how many saints could there be? Well, I went to that trusty source, the World Population Bureau of the United Nations, who is always on top of everything, and they, who are promoting zero population growth, have estimated that since humanity emerged 50,000 years ago, they're off by one zero, but it's okay, Uh, but when humanity emerged, when first humans started existence on Earth until today, the United Nations says between 46 billion humans have lived and 110 billion humans up through today. So between 50 and 100 billion. And if even 10% of those, if even 5% of those have believed and repented, not only are those billions of angels coming, but it says all of the saints are coming too. So can you imagine 
verse 25, when the Son of Man comes with his glory, I mean, that's enough, just his glory. Uh, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1 that it's, it's like flaming fire. He's going to look like this, this uh, you know, asteroid burning up in the atmosphere, just in flaming fire. He's coming, and, and everybody's scared to death, and behind him is the largest assemblage of anything that's ever been coming toward earth, and everybody's just falling apart. And then it says he sits on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them as a shepherd divides his sheep. I mean, this is tracking right with what Isaiah said, right with what Jeremiah said, just what Habakkuk said, just what every major and minor prophet said all the way through the Old Testament, that he's coming to earth and he's going to sit on a literal throne on earth. And he's going to gather everybody in front of him. He's going to divide them up and he's going to invite the people that survive the tribulation to live on earth for 1,000 years with no carnivorous animals, no poisonous spiders or serpents, uh, no, it, probably weeds will be abated. Wow, you know, I spent too long yesterday weeding in my garden. And all of that will be withdrawn and humanity will finally live in utopia with Christ as king. Christ's coming kingdom rule will be seen by every one of us every saint that's ever lived, every human alive on earth at the closing moments of the tribulation. Of course, we know that inescapable judgment comes. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 17, repent, or when I come, you're going to face the fire. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, not everyone who says with their mouth, Lord, Lord, but those who do my will, they go into the kingdom. And Jesus said in Matthew 13 that at that day, at the end of the age, the angels will come and separate and cast the wicked into the place of wailing and gnashing of teeth. But communion is where those two very diverse worlds combine. At communion, we primarily think of Jesus dying and being buried and risen and his blood cleansing us. But Jesus said, don't forget at communion, I'm coming and my kingdom's coming and you should long for that. And I think sometimes we just love what he did on the cross, and we don't realize the same one who died on the cross has to come back and right all wrongs. Did you read over the weekend? The Nigerians, I forget the name of the Muslim terrorist group in Nigeria, but they surrounded a little boarding school of, of uh, a little mission thing, and they took their jerry cans of gas, and they, they doused five-gallon cans around the dormitories of the boys and girls, and then they sat outside and shot them as they, you know, kind of like, you know, starting an anthill on fire and then killing the ants. They were, they were murdering those children. And, you know, we say, why doesn't God do something? He is. He's coming back. He knows who those terrorists are, and he knows everyone of the kids in the building, too. And they're all going to stand in front of him. See, we're just off on the timing. But God is going to bring his kingdom to earth. He is going to right all wrongs. And that's what the Lord told us, that communion reminds us Christ is coming. Christ is coming to set up his Father's kingdom. Christ is going to reign on earth. Christ is our king. And every time we celebrate communion, we're saying that we belong to him. And it's a promise that he's made that he's going to return. Now, one more thing. Look at Matthew 6. This, this is the icing on the cake. Not only does communion connect revelations, all of that prophesied future, all the stuff we've been slugging through, connecting it and saying that at communion we're supposed to remember that all that's going to happen and it's part of God's plan. But you know what it says in Matthew 6? This is the final connection. It says in Matthew 6, starting in verse 10, actually 9, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Look at verse 10. Your kingdom come. Do you know what we're supposed to pray? Not just think about at communion once or twice a month. Do you know what we're supposed to pray every day? Do what you promised you're going to do in Revelation. Come like you said you're going to come. Right all wrongs. Come in flaming fire. Take vengeance on the sinners. Reward the righteous. Let us enter into your kingdom. See, at Christ's ministry, he connected all this. He said, don't think a prophecy is detached and out there and it's kind of a non-essential. Every time you celebrate communion, remember, I'm not going to have communion until I get done with what I wrote about in Revelation. And every time you pray, ask me, look at verse 10, your kingdom come. Come and rule on earth, Lord Jesus. 
That's supposed to be on our hearts every day. So when we read the news, when we see the massacres, when we see all the what's going on in Egypt, what's going on wherever it's going to go on today, we say, thy kingdom come. Do what you told us you're going to do. The amazing blessing, thy kingdom come, means that we ask for Christ coming to rule. We don't just ask for it in the future. Part of it is saying, and I want to be doing what you called me to do because I'm your subject. I seek your kingdom in my life today. And that's a connection with communion. So every time we celebrate communion, you're thinking about revelation. Every time you pray, we're thinking about revelation. As we live our days, we're saying, Lord, you know what's happening. I want to be in sync with your plan. Let's bow for a word of prayer and prepare to do what he said to do and to invite him for his kingdom to come. Father in heaven, as the elders and deacons prepare to serve us communion, I pray that we would prepare our hearts, that we would say there's room in my heart for your plan, for your rule, for your way. You are my king, and I want to renew my obedience to you. I want to seek every day thy kingdom to come. I want you to come, O oh Lord, and stop all of the Antichrist plans and all of the devil's schemings and all of the evil and murder and wickedness and all of the blasphemy that's, that's just filling the world against you, our holy God. But the place you start is your kingdom coming in my life. That starts with salvation. And I pray at this communion that that anybody here who has never received Christ would realize this is not for them. Communion is only for those that have repented and believed on Jesus Christ, that you are the King, the Messiah, the Lord, the Savior. But for all of us who know you, we invite you to rule. Thy kingdom come, not only in the future, but in every moment of my life today. Thank you for this bread. It's a picture of your body which was broken and became sin to be the sacrifice for our salvation. And all of us who have by faith called upon your name are partakers in this wonderful picture of what you've done in our souls and spirits as you saved us. May we partake as we worship you this morning with great thanksgiving. Thank you for the bread. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, the bread we hold in our hands reminds us that Jesus literally came, suffered, and bled, and died, and on the cross, he became our sin. And all who have by faith, remember the Old Testament, how when they brought their little animal to the tabernacle or temple, the father standing in front of the family would put his hand on that animal, and what he was saying is, we're, we're guilty, that animal's innocent, and we want all of our guilt to be on that animal so it will take what we deserve. Did you know that's what salvation is? I say, I'm lost, I'm guilty, I'm helpless, I'm hopeless, I'm a sinner. Jesus is sinless and perfect and innocent, and I am trusting him to be my sin bearer. That's what the bread is. Jesus became sin for us. And Jesus said, this is my body that became sin for you, for me. This do remembering me. Let's partake together. Thank you, dear Lord, that because our sinless Savior died, our guilty souls were counted free. For God, the just, was reconciled and has pardoned me. We love you because you, through your death on the cross, poured out your life by the shedding of your blood for the remission of our sins, and we have endless life, endless freedom from the penalty of our sins, and someday from even the presence of any sin. Oh, what a blessing this cup is to us today of the new covenant in your blood. 
We pray that as we hold that cup and sing your praises, that we will offer worship that joins in with that around the throne. And soon we look forward to taking our place, bowing around your throne and saying, you are worthy of everything. May we live that way for your glory today and until you come or call. Thank you for the cup. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, whenever we say that, my God, I always think about old doubting Thomas. He says, man, you're going to have to prove it to me. Unless I see him and stick my hand in his side, I won't believe it. That's not very good faith, if you ask me. I mean, he was one of the 12. And Jesus heard that. And Jesus came to him and did what he asked for. You see, the Lord knows we struggle. He knows we have weak faith. Sometimes we don't have any faith. He hears all that. And he wants us at communion to remind ourselves, he's my Savior and my God. We're all kind of like doubting Thomas. And communion is when we say, I believe. So Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant that's in my blood. Every time you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's do that together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your great salvation. We thank you that we are saved to the uttermost, that we cannot out -sin your salvation once we have been purchased, once we have repented and believed. By faith alone, you grant to us endless life. I pray for some who are maybe our guests this morning who sit through a service like this and think it's interesting, but they have never yet repented and bowed and fallen before you. Lord, I pray that you would convict them of their utter lostness and sin and that they would cry out for whoever will call on the name of the Lord. You have said you will save. And Lord, if there's anyone that maybe is struggling, they want to talk with someone, pray with someone, be led to you as you draw them to yourself, I pray that as the elders and Titus two women are here at the end, as the invitation is always open, that you will draw them to yourself and we might minister to them. And for the rest of us, I pray, as we come back tonight, that we'd be challenged by the Stuckey's ministry that you are doing through them and that we would understand another step in how we can explain and answer the questions we face in life from your word. We give this day back to you because we love you and thank you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you.